Open the pod bay doors, Tom. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What would you do with a brain if you had one? Do? Why, if I had a brain, I could... Miles per hour. I could wire away. 46, 56 degrees. And so I lived through these events that were portrayed in this movie. Uh, it is a movie. It is a Hollywood version of events. Uh, there are incredible inaccuracies in that movie. There are things that just didn't happen. Uh, but they had to tell a good story, and that was the point, I think, of making the movie. Right? So that's the first thing. If we're just talking about the movie part of it, like I said, it'd be easy. Um, but there's a lot more to this story than, uh, than what they put in the script and what's up on the screen. Um, I actually, and I'm not a football apologist, I'm not somebody who, uh, I'm not a team physician for the NFL, I don't work for the NFL. As a matter of fact, when those congressional hearings were happening, at the end of the movie, I actually testified with Bennett Omalu and, and Ira Kasson uh, for, for uh, Congressman Conyers. And it was from those meetings that the NFL blew up their concussion committee and then reformed it. And, and Elliot Pellman asked me to be on the committee. And I was on the committee for two months and I resigned. <laughs> off the committee. I may be the only person in the history of the NFL, uh, head, neck, and spine committee, it's called now, uh, to resign from the committee. And I, I did so for, for reasons that, that should be obvious. So I'm not somebody that, that you know, wants to apologize to the NFL. That being said, um, where to start? I just want to say there's so, so many inaccuracies, so many things I, I want to tackle in such a short period of time, no pun intended. But uh, I will just throw some data out there, right? So let's talk about science. Let's talk about numbers. One inaccuracy in that movie, uh, three cases does not make medical causality. I'm not sure where that, that's just kind of, any doctor in the room, any scientist in the room probably had a little moment of cringe there, right? Um, that's one thing. But if you look at published data on NFL players, and these are people that played from the late 60s to the late 1980s, and this was published in a series of papers through NIOSH, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. They studied all former NFL players that played um, between the 60s and 80s for five years or more. These were fu uh, fully pensioned players. That's how they got into the study. So they included the people who were in this movie, Mike Webster uh, and, and Mr. Long and, and those folks were in this cohort. This cohort was studied up until 2008 when the study closed and the papers were being published in 2012 and 2013. So this cohort of people, about 4,000 or so former NFL players that played five years or more, they had every cause of death. They had death certificates for the whole group. They had uh, health statistics for all kinds of things uh, that they did, heart, heart disease and diabetes and that kind of thing. There were nine suicides in that cohort over roughly 20 years nine of them. If they had been the general population, you would have expected 21 suicides. So that's another inaccuracy in the movie. I don't know, they they may try to make the point that 12 Steelers had committed suicide in some period of time. That was totally inaccurate. But since 2008, and these, these cases here in the movie started at about 2004, and I think Durson was 20, or 2010, 2011, I think, somewhere in there. So right around 2008 and afterwards, the suicide rate has gone through the roof in former NFL players. This is actual data, right? Anybody have an idea as, as to why the suicide rate has gone up in NFL players? What's that? Has the game become more violent? I think you can argue that it's, it's faster, right? Uh, players are bigger, faster, stronger. Um, I can tell you that the number of hits they take now are far, far less as far as the number of practices they have actually that are contact practices, uh, the number of players that don't, that don't go both ways on offense and defense anymore. So the number of hits is probably a lot less. The, 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 and the average G-force of an NFL hit, uh, Will Smith said something about, oh, the typical force is 60 Gs. Or, or concussion happens at 60. The typical force is 100. Now, the average NFL hit is 26.5 Gs. I don't know where you got that number from. And, and there is no concussion threshold. That's been shown over and over again in research. So I don't think it's the, the hitting. 
And, and again, this because these are the people that are committing suicide are the ones that played in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Because they don't look for now, or because the years have passed. Well, these are individuals who are taking their own life, right? So they're not they're not looking for anything. They're just they're having problems in their life, right? They're they're depressed. They have headaches. They have cognitive problems. They can't control their behavior. Um, they take their own life. These individuals. So. What, what happened in 2008? Well, the financial collapse happened. That's, that's, yeah, that's true. Um, that, is, that is probably a, a piece of the variable. Um, that's when we started talking about it. Right? Dr. Umalu's book called um, Play Hard, Die Young came out on, in Amazon and uh, booksellers around 2006, 2007. Those congressional hearings were 2008. Right? In our clinic, in my program at the Sports Serology Clinic, we see patients, little, little, little athletes to former athletes, everything in between. I can tell you from our experience, more and more patients every single week are asking us about, well, I don't want my kid to play football because he's going to have his third concussion and, and I don't want him to take his own life. We never had those conversations before. Has anybody ever heard of the suicide contagion concept? It's a real concept, right? This is, this is a documented thing that happens in populations. If you have any population, you say, look, here's a population of people who love to go to the Michigan Theater, and somebody committed suicide, and you, and you publicize that. And for some reason, the Michigan Theater makes people depressed and, right? Suicide rate will go up in the population of people that come to the Michigan Theater. Absolutely, right? There was a case um, in 2015, November 2015, of a hockey player, uh, Todd Ewan. Uh, anybody hear of Todd Ewan? A couple, a couple hockey folks probably nodding their head, right? So Mr. Ewan was a fighter in the, in the classic sense. He retired from hockey in 2007. He had something like 475 professional hockey fights, right, which is basically bare knuckle boxing, right? Uh, when he retired, he started having problems in 09, 010, or 010, uh, 10 or 11. Um, they were very similar to what was documented with Junior Seau and Dave Dewars and, and those folks. He and his wife were very public about his, his problems that he was having. Uh, they, they said, yeah, I, I'm the next one to have CTE, and, we're changing our life because of it. Uh, he took his own life in November, and his brain went to the University of Toronto, and it was normal. His brain was absolutely normal. So what, what, what led to Mr. Human's suicide, really, in that, in that case? That's why I said at the beginning about messaging. There's no question that brains don't like to get hit over and over again. And repetitive hits is a risk factor for depression and dementia and other problems. And these things do occur, and we do see them in our patients. But it's irresponsible to put the messaging in such a clear way, especially when you have a movie, and I'm sorry, but the, the title, Concussion, this movie's not about concussions. This is not about your 12-year-old daughter soccer player who came home with a concussion. A concussion is a transient injury that goes away, period. This is a movie about CTE. They use the word concussion because everybody knows it. Right? Concussions don't lead to CTE. It's a totally different pathological construct. Two different things altogether. Getting hit can cause a concussion. Having repetitive hits can cause CTE. But concussions do not cause CTE. And that's part of the problem is now whenever you have any, anybody who experiences a concussion, there are three million a year in the United States from playing sports, they think of that movie. Right? And, and, th and that's driving a lot of, of, of fear, a lot of just myth and misunderstanding of, of what's really going on out there. Um, so that's, I guess, a really important thing to, to keep in mind. Um, there are a whole bunch of other inaccuracies I don't want to get into the specifics of. Uh, but, you know, in, in, the, in the grand sense, um, you know, I think the movie, uh, you know, it, it took the conversation a little bit further than it had been before. It kind of put a bow on this idea of, of repetitive hits from sports are not good for you. And, and I think as, as a neurologist, as a physician, uh, you know, I, I would agree with that. You know, I think, but on this other side of it, there are a lot of good things that come from sports, too. And they, they, tried to, they tried to show that a little bit by talking about the grace of the game, but I'm talking about what sports actually do for individuals, right? And every sport has its own set of risks and benefits. And we need to understand what those risks and benefits are if we're going to make good recommendations about uh, care for our patients or our kids or, or anything else. So uh, I'll, I'll stop right there. I already have a question. I think you want to? Go ahead. Is 
Right. So you would think uh, her question is about different helmets, right? So um, absolutely, helmet technology every year is advancing and, and getting better and better. Um, the problem is that a, a concussion or, or, you know, the brain is free-floating as, as was, you know, shown there in the jar with the thing in the water. Um, so a helmet's not going to stop the brain from moving. Right? If you have, your brain doesn't care what hits the skull if the, if the head still moves. Right? Now, a helmet's going to absorb a certain amount of force, right? but typically if you have a, a 50G hit, if you have a top-of-the-line helmet, you may be mitigating you know, 6 to 7% of the force. So you'll, you'll, you'll get a little bit of reduction. However, um, that's just for concussions. The, the, you know, there's no threshold, like I said, for creating the physiological injury that, that creates the clinical syndrome of concussion. However, if you um, ask me, my, my kid wants to play football, he may take 8,000 hits over the course of his career. If he has a helmet that takes forces from here and moves it down even a little bit, you add that up over 8,000 hits and it probably makes a difference. So I think there is a good role for helmets to play and um, there are all kinds of different technologies out there that are being investigated, but I think it's important to understand that um, probably the best piece of safety equipment is our techniques and our training and medical care and all those things. Is there any kind of, um, since all this, I mean, your answer might just show up my search. Um, has there been anything like a clearinghouse for people's uh, like data created since all this? So, um, <clears throat> good question. So, you know, three cases is not medical causality, nor is four, nor is, nor, nor is 5,000 cases, really. I mean, cases are, are cases. Um, you really need to look at uh, the rates of, of diagnoses in a population, right? So it's not enough to know that I've got 10 or 20 or 40 cases of football players that I've found, to, found a problem in. I need to know how many don't have the problem, right? And so people are starting to collect data on that, um, the difficulty there is it's hard to get people who aren't having problems to donate brains. So what you get is a skewed sample of people that are having problems, right? The other thing that doesn't come across in that movie is what is CTE really, right? CTE is a, is a neuropathological description. It is a finding at autopsy of how a tissue looks. It is not a description of how somebody's doing in life. Many of the cases of CT that have been published and talked about in the literature, these folks have had no neurological problem in life, but their brain has had changes that look like what Dr. Amalu saw back in Pittsburgh, which is fine. You just gotta make sure you know what you're talking about, right? Because you can, you can find the, the pathological finding it doesn't mean that there's a clinical effect from that in this case. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, so there are four that I know of. Actually, the closest one is over here at, in Kalamazoo at Western Michigan University. Uh, it's a, sort of a, new, a newer um, brain bank that's, that's looking at this question. Uh, Boston University probably has been the most productive, uh, at least in the literature. They have 135 cases or so. Dr. Rose, feel free to correct me if I'm getting some numbers wrong. Um, uh, the NIH actually is, is, has, has a database now as well, and the University of Toronto. So there, there are places that are starting to collect cases mainly. The problem is you need to be able to study the population. Right? It's hard to get people to donate brains who don't have problems. Yeah. So do you have a tip for parents who's choosing sport for his child? So if you're a parent, I'm a parent, I've got three daughters. Um, what, what sport do you choose? So I think... You, you let the kid decide, I think, is what, you, is what you do, right? I mean, you have to understand that, that people will play sports for a lot of different reasons. Um, and, I, and I think thing one is don't, don't push a sport on your kid because it's what you wanted to play or what you played. I tried to get two of my three daughters to play hockey, and it's, it's been a failure. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to push because they don't, they don't like uh, skating so much. 
But I think, uh, seriously though, from a medical perspective, the most important thing is talk to the coach. Um, you know, understand what, what is the coach's perspective on not just brain issues, but all injuries, right? Um, when do you hit? How much do you hit? Who's around medically to help take care of athletes and, or make diagnoses? And, um, you know, what, what are the medical things that are in place that can help your, your kids when they're hurt? Um, and then as far as the particular sport goes, you know, like I said, each sport is different, and, and you can get different things out of different types of sports. So, it's, you know, it's, it's a very complex question, and I think I would just take the time to with your child and kind of figure out what sport is best for them, really. Have there been any studies on uh, neurological disorders in sports, specifically in boxing? And the other thing is rugby, right? Because it's a sport with a lot of contact, but no helmet, so it's not as much head-to-head -head contact. Right, so uh, studies in, in boxing, it, are, boxing is difficult to study. It's, it's a tough population because they're, they're self-employed. Uh, they don't have a one governing body that you can go to and do a study on them. Uh, when people have done studies, they have found uh, rates of neurodegenerative diseases that um, you know, approach 25% uh, or so in professional boxers, which is much different than amateur boxers, which is different than MMA, and um, that whole group is different. Now, I, I would think um, the other thing to point out, though, is that rates of things like Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease and e even ALS have been shown to be higher uh, in these populations. So those things we, we do kind of know. Um, other part of your question was? Rugby, rugby right. Um, so rugby, uh, no, right, no, no helmet, no pads per se. Um, the concussion rate of diagnosed concussions is about the same, if not a little less, than American football. Um, wh wh why that is is a good question. It may be simply an artifact of the medical system. Uh, here in the U.S., we had a tremendous increase in concussion incidents that started in 2005, 2006. And it's the same reason I talked about it at the beginning. We weren't getting more concussions, we we're just looking for it. And I don't think they started looking for it as much uh, in rugby, per se. Um, obviously, it's a different sport. Um, you hear a lot about, oh, it does improve American football by taking off the face mask, taking off the helmet. When the reality is you would uh, change the sport, for sure, and you would also end up with a lot more facial injuries and other problems, too. So you have to be careful what you, what you uh, ask for. Um, I play college football, and I would like to make a blanket statement. There is no rationale to allow a child to play football. Over and above the concussion issue, every play and every practice and every game, your whole goal is to hurt the person across you. That's not a good psychological place to be. And that rage can carry over in other aspects of life. So I would say it's not justifiable to allow children. So that's a good, in case anybody didn't hear the statement, um, blanket statement, unjustifiable to let children play football. Do you mean the like 18 and under or 12 and under? Or? or if you want to go from a rational perspective, the sport should not exist. Your whole goal is to kill somebody. And the coaches perpetuate that. You hear about that. Yeah. That's probably you're out there to kill somebody. So that's one of the reasons I brought up the point about historical perspective. And, and I grew up playing hockey, so my, my first real introduction to football, the culture of it, you know, it, in, in, in the actual field of play was as a physician. Um, but I've been doing it for many, many years. And, and thankfully, I can say it's not the same game as when you play. Do you think they're less violent? I think they hit a lot less. Um, I think yeah, they absolutely do. They're stronger, they're better. When you watch what's going on in that screen, that's unjustifiable to cheer somebody getting their head hit like that with their legs cut out from under. I don't, I just can't see it. But I understand the money is there. And that's what I... Also, again, let me just reiterate, reiterate one thing. So those, first of all, those practices weren't real. The practices weren't real and they were, they were depicting the 70s. There are no more Oklahoma drills. There are no more hit, just go find somebody and hit your head drills. Uh, our program, for example, worked with Western Michigan University this year. Um, we, we took care of every, every game we were on the sidelines with them. We did their preseason stuff. In the summer, they had something like three full contact practices in a month. Ten years ago or tw 20 years ago, that would have been three or four a week. And that's the trend. I'm just, that, as, as an example, and I understand what you're saying, but I'm just saying that the game is different than it was when we played. That's thing one. Thing two, I absolutely agree that there's no reason... You can teach football skills, and the point of the game is to score points, but you can teach football skills without hitting 
um, when, until people are ready to do it. Uh, another point I'll make is, you, you know, you, you made the, you made the, you know, so, sometimes the, the observation of you take that rage and you build it up and that continues in the life. I can see that happening. Uh, the other thing that we've seen probably more often is that football is an outlet to get out rage and anger. And when they stop playing, they have issues because they're not playing the sport anymore. Exercise is important, no, no question about it. Exercise can certainly... Let me, let me tell you a quick story about a patient that came to see me about I don't know, five years ago or so. Former NFL player, he was um, out of the league about seven years. He came to me because I'd taken care of one of his college, roommate, college teammates, also played in the NFL. Um, his wife was concerned because he had been out of the league for about five years or seven years or so, and he started having the same problems about year two, year three. He started having behavioral problems and mood problems and some memory problems. Uh, these things started escalating, and she was getting scared because he was getting violent at home, just like it was depicted on the screen. So concerned, and actually the, the main concern came when um, somebody he knew, an NFL player, took his own life. And he started acting differently after that. And his wife was really concerned that he, he was going to do something about it. So she um, actually tricked him to come see me. He didn't want to come see a doctor. She said, we're going to Ann Arbor for some other reason. We got to the clinic. He was really upset, as you can imagine. Right? So start talking to him about his, his problems. And it sounds just like the things that you're describing and you're worried about and was depicted there. Uh, but I did what a, a good physician does. I take a history and don't make assumptions, and think critically about a problem. I can tell you when it comes to brain health, when it comes to how humans behave, uh, things that affect their behavior, there's a lot more to it than, than just one variable. And in this particular case, we started talking about his history. Well, in the, in the league for uh, nine years or so, whatever, uh, he was an outside linebacker, really fast, really strong, violent collisions, uh, really good player, was in the Pro Bowl two or three years, I think. Never got diagnosed with a concussion, which didn't surprise me because of the, the way the medical stuff was when he was playing. Uh, but he said he was knocked out two or three times. <laughs> that gives you an idea of like, you know, what's really going on in his life. But during that time period, he and his wife had a great marriage. They, start, they had started having a family, financially very responsible. Um, going back to college, he played in the Big Ten, actually, all Big Ten linebacker. Uh, never had a diagnosed concussion in college either. Um, Going back to high school, I said, well, you know, tell me about high school, I, you know, I didn't, I, I just started playing high school in 10th grade. And I said, that's kind of strange, you started playing football in 10th grade in the NFL, usually you start playing a lot younger than that. And he said, well, I had a different childhood. Now, it, it takes me about 45 minutes to get this history out of him. You have to be, you have to take time, right? And what he said was, you know, by, by age 12 or 13, he had been kicked out of four public schools for violent behavior. He, he was uncontrollable. He had, either his mom was in jail and his dad was dead or the other way around, I forget which one it was. He was a foster kid at that point and was basically this close from being in jail. And he had an uncle that came along and said, look, you're kind of a mess. Uh, I can't take care of you, but I've got some money to put you in, in an academy, in a military type academy uh, for like an eighth grade he went in or so. Now he started doing better when he had rules and, and expectations and people gave him structure. Um, tenth grade, though, when they realized he was 6'5 and could run like the wind, the football, football coach was like, well, you should play football. And that's when his life changed. That's when actually his grades went through the roof. Uh, he, you know, he excelled academically, socially, uh, got an engineering degree in college. This was a guy who then, when, he, when football was taken away from him, started acting like he had before. He had a very clear-cut personality disorder. He needed to cause pain in people. That's what he needed to be normal. Now, and football gave him a mechanism to do that. And that's one case as well. You say that's just one case as well. Absolutely. But there's maybe a, a reason, a good reason for the rest of soccer, yoga, dance. Look, look, at, look I don't want to get sidetracked on this. Like I said, I'm not a football apologist. I'm just, what I want people to do is have a critical thought process about the whole picture. Excellent. 
Okay, yeah, so am I. Well, the, the idea, and let's be very clear, the idea that repetitive hits to the brain are, is, is bad for you is not a new one. This was described in the medical literature in the 1920s. Right? So it's not a new concept that we should be on the lookout for these problems. The, the takeaway point is it, it, is a, it is a problem. It does happen in people. Right? It happens a lot less than certainly this movie tends to make it out to be, as well as the oversimplification of messages in the media. It's a lot less than that based on statistics. Like, there's actual data on how often former NFL players have neurological problems. And it's higher than the general population for sure. Actually, that's, that same population of people who I said, again, were protective for suicide. Let's just repeat that. Playing in the NFL for 20 years was protective for suicide until 2008. Okay? That same group was also studied for rates of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and ALS, like I mentioned before, and they had rates of diseases that were three to four times that of the general population, right? which, which should alarm people, and it is a risk factor, absolutely. But that means that their risk went from 2 or 3% to 10 or 12%. That, that's all we're saying, and this is, the, this is the group of people that have the most exposure to forces. Right? And so when, you, when I have a um, you know, a 12-year-old soccer player coming in and they're worried about CTE in somebody who gets three or four hits a year, you know, you got to have the perspective of these people are taking 800 hits a year for 20 years. It's a, it's a different population altogether. Absolutely. Um, no, no question. So football is something, obviously, that is important to our culture, and that's why it's gotten a lot of attention, and that's why congressmen have gotten involved, because they like that, you know, that cultural part of it, so they can get some votes or whatever. Um, and I would say the majority of, in, in the United States, the majority of research has been done in American football up until about four or five years ago, maybe a little bit longer than that. Uh, we, we see now large studies that are done on, on whole um, populations of, of, of athletes across both genders, contact sports, non-contact sports, you name it. So, mostly in athletics. Mostly in athletics. Um, sure. In any population that has a um, ex repetitive exposure to forces, we need to be concerned about. So, one of the other populations that's studied a lot is the military. Um, there's something called the DOD. A care study, which is a combination of NCAA athletes and Department of Defense military personnel. Uh, they have something like 35,000 patients in that study, which was started here at the University of Michigan, actually, and is being carried through uh, 35 centers or so uh, around the country. So, uh, absolutely looking into all these things. <laughs> Right, so actually, thank you for that, because I want to finish that thought, because I said CTE is a, yes, a, a, CTE is a pathological finding. She's asking about diagnosing CTE, is there a test you can do? So CTE is a pathological finding, which right now you can only diagnose at autopsy. Uh, you could do a biopsy theoretically, but I think you really need to see the whole brain and get a sample of it to get a good sense of what's going on. So. But that's, diagno that's diagnosing or, or describing the pathological finding. You can make a diagnosis on a living person of the clinical equivalent of that, which we call traumatic encephalopathy syndrome, right? So if somebody comes to our clinic, um, we, and we, we have former players in our clinic all the time, whatever sport, uh, they're in their 50s, 60s, or 70s, and they have problems, we start that process of, well, what is really going on with you? The most common cause of complaints of that sort in population 40 to 60s are, are the very common things that occur in all humans. They're not sleeping enough, they're depressed, they're drinking too much, they're using medications, so on and so forth. You start treating those things and their quote unquote CTE gets better. And, and that's one of the messages here. I, and I, I, I don't wanna leave people here with the idea that I'm, I'm trying to minimize, it's a great movie, but it's over the top because what it's done is it's forced people to stop thinking. It's forced people like Mr. Ewan, who took his own life because he didn't think he had a choice. 
because he was convinced he had CTE, right? Uh, we need to be better at how we describe these things. We need to be better consumers of information, better consumers of the messaging, because you oversimplify it, and the suicide rates are going up. Just curious about why did you resign from uh, the <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll just say there were differences in, in, in uh, what I thought the focus should be. I, I work tirelessly with the NFL Players Association. Because in, in, my, in, in, in our line of work, when you, when you take care of athletes, and so this was highlighted a little bit in this movie, this idea of the team physician and who you really work for. That's a huge problem. There are a lot of team physicians who work for teams. They care about the winning. They don't care about the patients. And I'm sorry to say that occurs at every level. Um, and so that's an ethical thing that we always have to be on the watch for. Um, in my own professional life, you know, I've, I've decided from the get-go, like, no, it's patient first no matter what you're doing. Um, you can work for a team if that team allows you to take care of patients first. Um, unfortunately, our sports business is one that kind of makes it more difficult for that to happen sometimes. Um, I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Thank you.